Now programming from the Illinois Channel, an independent nonpartisan corporation formed to provide nonpartisan coverage of Illinois state government and other public affairs events taking place across Illinois. For more information on the Illinois Channel, please visit our website at www.illinoischannel.org. Just ahead, recently Governor Rauner signed a bill mandating health insurance companies provide coverage for a disorder known as PANDAS, Pediatric Autoimmune Neuropsychiatric Disorder Associated with Strep. First, we air three minutes of an interview we conducted in May with Kate Drury, a mother of a child with PANDAS. Following that, we'll attend the bill signing ceremony with Governor Rauner and others from Mrs. Drury's home. Then in about 10 minutes, we attend a speech at the City Club of Chicago by Diane Rauner, the president of the Ounce of Prevention Fund, as she explains the struggle to fight child poverty amidst state budget problems. And finally, in about one hour, we run an encore presentation of our interview with Taylor Pensenow, a former reporter with the St. Louis Post-Dispatch who covered Illinois politics, about his recollections of certain Illinois politicians why nothing is getting done in Springfield, the effect of Illinois political power being concentrated in Chicago, and his advice for aspiring journalists. That's all just ahead, after a brief word from one of our advisory council members. Hi, I'm Jim McNamee, president of the Illinois Public Pension Fund Association. Since 1985, we've worked to educate the public and those who serve as trustees and pension boards about issues that impact the financial health of publicly funded pensions. Our members manage over $18 billion in pension assets. That's a huge number. But we never forget those dollars belong to the men and women who've worked as firefighters, police officers, and as educators. We want them to know that their pension dollars are safely invested. They also want to know that someone will keep an eye on legislation that could threaten their pension. And that's why the Illinois Public Pension Fund Association is fighting against laws that would reduce the pensions earned by our members. And this is why we support the work of the Illinois Channel. Their unbiased, in-depth coverage of the pension reform issue allows us and our members to hear arguments on both sides of the pension issue, to follow legislation as it moves through committee, or to hear unedited interviews with key lawmakers as they discuss what changes are being considered. Pensions are very important. They're also very complex. Pension reform can't adequately be covered in sound bites. But the Illinois Channel provides a connection to the Capitol, the governor, and lawmakers that we all need to stay on top of key issues. Hi, I'm Jim McNamee, president of the Illinois Public Pension Fund Association. I watch the Illinois Channel, and I hope you do too. Next, recently Governor Rauner signed a bill mandating health insurance companies provide coverage for a disorder known as PANDAS, Pediatric Autoimmune Neuropsychiatric Disorder Associated with Strep. First, we aired three minutes of an interview we conducted in May with Kate Drury, a mother of a child with PANDAS. Following that, we'll attend the bill signing ceremony with Governor Rauner and others from Mrs. Drury's home. This runs about 10 minutes. Ladies, thanks for joining us. And you are both mothers of uh, children who have been impacted by disease I think most of us have never heard of. And I wanted to get your stories about what happened to your child and then how you happened to be, which you probably didn't expect to be standing here in the state capitol, lobbying for legislation. Right. Kate, what is your story? Um, my son, on his eighth birthday, um, he was completely normally happy functioning before. On his eighth birthday, he woke up with strep throat. He then woke up a completely different child. He can no longer function. He developed extreme OCD. Um, he became anorexic because he was scared of food. Um, he was scared of water, so he wouldn't bathe for two months. Um, he had motor um, tics so bad that we thought he was having seizures. We begged our doctors for answers. We had no idea what it was. Um, they were telling us that we needed to put him in into an institution, that we may never get him back again. He screamed in pain from the minute he woke up to the minute he went to sleep. Um, and my two younger kids could not even, I couldn't even take care of them. They were taking care of themselves because I was with him constantly. Um, finally, after two months of um, 
him going through this pain and us not knowing what it is and almost having to give up and put him in an institution, we found a doctor that said, I think he has pandas. Let's get his blood work. We did the blood work. He had strep titers six times higher than normal reference range. He needed high dose antibiotics. Um, he started coming back to us. He started to eat again. He started to um, be able to uh, read again and um, started to be able to leave the house. Um, his brain was so inflamed though um, because what had happened is his, um, he got the strep throat, so his own antibodies, instead of attacking the strep, attacked the back of his brain, um, which was causing all of these motor and emotional um, functions to decline. Um, so we went ahead. Um, we found one of the top doctors in the United States right in Hinsdale, Illinois. Um, we decided to go ahead with IVIG, which is fresh blood antibodies from other donors, to reset his immune system. We couldn't afford it. It was $12,000. For one treatment, our family, I have a big family, they decided to do a fundraiser. They raised the funds. My son had the treatment. And, and let me interject, you, you, you had to be paying for it yourself because it wasn't covered by insurance. Is Correct. That right? It was the recommended um, you know, treatment to cure him, and it wasn't covered by insurance. We went ahead with it um, because we knew it would give our son his life back. So we raised the money, we did the treatment. Six months later, um, after my son had missed almost all of second grade, he was 100%. Back in third grade, football star, now he's in sixth grade, football star, basketball star, straight A's, honor roll student, um, not a symptom again, so. And when he had strep throat, how quickly did his symptoms of the panda disease manifest itself? It was um, almost within a day or so. Um, the strep throat first came on. We did low dose antibiotics to treat the strep, but the, ana the antibodies were already attacking his brain. It was, um, he was too weak to fight it. Um, so we didn't pair the two and two together until two months later when a doctor brought it up again. Uh, Governor, I just wanted to thank you so much for coming to my home. Um, to sign this bill that means so much to my family, but so many others in Illinois and across the US. Um, this is just amazing. So thank you so much for coming. And um, I'm Wendy Navarra from Pandas Pans Advocacy and Support. And I also would like to extend a huge amount of gratitude to you for coming today. Um, and I'd like to also thank our legislators who have stood by us for the last couple of years as we we fought uh, something that we thought at one time was insurmountable. So we are so grateful that you're here and we're so grateful that kids in Illinois will be getting access to co coverage for pandas. I mean, it's, it's terribly important and we're happy to see you. I'm State Representative Deb Conroy and it was the privilege of my career to be able to be a small part of Team Charlie. Um, Kate and Wendy and Charlie and Charlie are the reason that we're here today. Their fight is why we're here and I am so grateful that we will now be able to offer the coverage that these families need in the state of Illinois and it is my hope that this will continue in the other 49 states. Hi, I'm Senator Tom Cullerton of the 23rd District. Uh, it was my honor to be part of this. It was my honor to meet uh, Kate on our first initial meeting and start this process and get us moving. Uh, we have had some incredible partners, the advocacy for pandas and the incredible moms. I have to say that again and again. The families are what made this possible. The families advocating for their children, the families stepping up and doing a ton of legwork made our job as legislators easier. Uh, we had full support for both sides of the aisle. We're very glad the governor's here today to sign this bill, but we could not have done this without all of the moms and all of the families who are advocating for their children to find an end to this, so thank you. Uh, hi, uh, good morning. I'm Senator Chris Nybo. Uh, Governor, thank you so much for being here and for signing this bill. Uh, Senator Cullerton and Representative Conroy are the true heroes on this bill. Um, they, they championed this in the legislature, got unanimous support. I'm a chief co-sponsor. Uh, I'm, I'm delighted to see this bill signed. Uh, as, a, as a parent, uh, I've got a good friend, Scott Breka, who's, whose son is about to receive treatment, and so uh, we'll be able to provide coverage for his son. And as a parent of a daughter who has diabetes, um, I have firsthand experience uh, dealing with insurance companies and being denied and, and fighting insurance companies and trying to get coverage. So anything that we can do in this state to get treatment for kids who need it 
uh, I will always be on board. So I'm, I'm delighted to be here, and, and thank you for inviting me. State Representative Peter Breen from Lombard. Again, Governor, I, I want to thank you so much. When I asked for a bill signing, I didn't realize. You know, they called up and said, hey, how about Tuesday? And I said, oh, my goodness. And what are we going to do? And said, uh, you know, to Kate, wouldn't it be something to have a bill signed into law on your kitchen table, and particularly Charlie's law? And uh, this is something that was a great example of bipartisan cooperation. Uh, even to that, that, cr that critical first vote in the House, I remember on that last day before Easter recess, we went and, and, uh, and Deb, the bill was on the board and it didn't go. And the bill was on the board and didn't go. And my wife Margie was texting with Kate and they said, well, Deb doesn't want to call it. She doesn't think she has the votes. And so we went over there and we worked it out and said, we've got the votes, let's do it. And all of a sudden it was unanimous out of both chambers. So again, this is how uh, when we come together on these key important issues, we can get things done in Illinois. And uh, just an incredible honor for us in Lombard to have the governor coming back. Uh, and, I, and I wanted to just recognize very briefly our mayor of Lombard is here, Keith Gennario, as well as our county board member, uh, Pete DeCiani. So again, Governor, thank you so much, and thank you again for coming back to the lovely uh, Lilac Village of Lombard. Good morning, everyone. This is a very important day. This shows the good things that can happen when we come together promptly, effectively, to put our children first. Our young people should be the top priority in everything that we do in the state of Illinois. Our children, their health, their education, their well-being should be first and foremost in everything we do in public service and in government. Today shows what we can get done when we work together on a bipartisan basis to move quickly, expeditiously, and we wanted to come together quickly. When I got this bill, I said, let's quickly set up a time when I can sign it. Um, this was bipartisan. Uh, took a lot of work. I especially want to uh, thank Kate Drury and Wendy and the other parents who have been advocating on this issue for a long time. It's very important. Illinois will now be the first state in America. Illinois will now be the first state in America to have insurance coverage for this vicious disease. This is pediatric, autoimmune, neuropsychiatric disorder that can come from being um, infected with strep strep as a youngster. It can cause nerve damage, can ca it can cause um, significant psychiatric disorders. If we catch it early with proper treatment, we can actually cure it and actually deal with it on an effective basis. If we don't address it and treat it early, it can lead to longer term, more, much more serious illness and challenges for our young people. It's the right thing to do. Uh, we want to thank the insurance companies and the insurance industries for working with us on this. Now we will have all insurance companies in Illinois and the only state in America where we have all insurance companies covering this issue for health for our children. This is a very good day, great progress. I want to thank um, Representative Conroy, uh, uh, Senator Cullerton, Senator Nybo, Representative Breen, and all the members of the General Assembly for addressing this challenge, and it's an honor for me to join them today and all the parents here um, to do what's right for our children and put our children's health and well-being first and foremost. And with that, we'll sign the bill. You're watching the <laughs> Illinois Channel an independent nonprofit corporation formed to provide gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage of Illinois state government and other public affairs events taking place across Illinois. Next, we attend a speech at the City Club of Chicago by Diane Rauner, the president of the Ounce of Prevention Fund, as she explains the struggle to fight child poverty amidst state budget problems. This runs about 45 minutes. Thank you, Ed. And thank you to the City Club for having me here today. Uh, it's an honor to talk about an issue of great personal passion, but I think also tremendous importance to our state, an area of great strength and opportunity, early childhood development. You know, Illinois has built a tremendous early childhood education system but uh, we're ahead, but w the rest of the country is catching up, and the world is changing here at home. So today, what I'd like to do is talk about three things. First, the impact of very significant demographic changes in Chicago and across Illinois. 
Secondly, why the early years are such an important opportunity for investing in human capital. And third, how urgent the need is to prioritize these investments even as resources become more scarce. So let me start with the demographic changes. First, uh, we can see that poverty in our state among the youngest children has actually increased since the recession. Again, these are the most vulnerable and the youngest children, um, and uh, we are not going in the right direction, guys. Also, quite interestingly, the place where poverty is happening has changed. So poverty in the city of Chicago since 2000 has increased by about 14%. In the suburbs, it's increased by 99%. There are now more poor people, twice as many poor people, in the suburbs of Chicago as in the city of Chicago. So th this is due to a lot of things. Clearly, we know about the transformation of the Chicago public housing system. But it's also the case that suburban mor mortgages were easier to get, um, actually um, housing costs are cheaper in the suburbs. The um, immigrant population has moved to the suburbs, and the suburbs were also really hard hit in the recession. Um, construction and other sectors really declined. So when we look statewide, what we see is, first of all, this is again 09 to 14, we see that overall increase in poverty, and we see the, um, it, the, trend, the, the movement of poverty to the suburbs and the persistence of poverty in the rural areas. I'd like to stop for a minute and talk about what this means in real terms, in terms of services to children and families. Services in a city are easier to access. In the suburbs, we have to think about transit. How do people get to services? How do people get to their supports? This is true in the, in the rural areas. The schools and um, other programs in the suburbs and in the rural areas are not likely to have the capacity to serve children in poverty. And these changes are happening very, very quickly. It's also really important to acknowledge, and we at the OUNCE have been working in partnership with community-based agencies across the state for 35 years. It has always been the case that the capacity to run programs is not necessarily where the people are. There's far more capacity in the city of Chicago, far more human capital to support, to support the programs that serve people than there are in the rural counties and in the suburbs. And the challenge that we're facing right now is that as the demographic changes shift precipitously, we don't have the capacity in the suburbs and in the rural counties to handle it. Okay, that's poverty. Now let's look at diversity. English language learners, again, an enormous change across our country and across our state. In our state, the population of English language learners has gone up by 25% over the last decade. Now, interestingly, in fact, the population of English language learners in the city of Chicago has declined by 6%, whereas it's grown by 52% across the rest of the state. So again, think about what that means in terms of service and capacity. School districts across the suburbs and in the rural counties are scrambling to find certified English language learning teachers who can serve these populations. And this is um, interestingly, particularly, of course, the youngest, the, the young, youngest children are the leading edge of demographic change. We have over 200,000 Spanish-speaking children under the age of five in our state. Not to mention tens of thousands who are speaking Arabic, Chinese, Urdu, Polish, Hindi. And we do not have the capacity to do what we know is developmentally appropriate to serve these children in, the, in our education system. This trend is statewide. It's happening rapidly. And we know that building that capacity is particularly challenging outside of Chicago. So, we have more impoverished children, we have more diverse needs. We also have an increase in children with developmental delays. Now there's a couple of reasons for this. The first is a really good reason. We've gotten a whole lot better at saving premature babies. That's wonderful. But they're coming into the school system with a greater likelihood for developmental delays. We've also seen a steep rise in the number of children who are identified with autism spectrum disorder and that 
identification is happening earlier, which is a good thing. Early intervention is a really, really good thing. It's just that it costs a lot of money and it takes a lot of capacity. And then finally, we know that children exposed to poverty, to homelessness, um, to um, in child welfare or in other at-risk circumstances are more likely to experience developmental delays. We have a budding and terrifying crisis that's beginning in our rural counties of babies born to opioid addicted mothers. Nobody knows what those children are going to need. Now national data on disability preference right now would suggest that about 13% of children birth to three are experiencing developmental delays and would benefit from early intervention services. We in our state are serving about 4% of them. So many children are remaining unidentified and many children are identified but there is no service available for them. Again, because the human capacity, the speech language therapist, the occupational therapist, the people that do this work are not evenly distributed where the kids are. And then finally, um, our, our most um, disadvantaged in this, in this um, state and across the country have not recovered from the Great Recession. We know that unemployment among low-income workers is 27% in our state. One and a half million people in Illinois are food insecure. Over half a million children in Illinois are food insecure. Just let that sink in. In our country, in this rich country, half a million children in Illinois are food insecure, and 50,000 children in our state are homeless. So we have a different pro poverty problem than we had a decade ago, but the problem is bigger and more pressing than ever. And here's the worst part, and the dumbest part from a developmental perspective. The younger you are in this country, the more likely you are to be poor. Even among children, children birth to five, the youngest children are more likely to be poor. That makes sense because their parents are younger less, and less um, uh, well off. But it's also the case that children under the age of three are more than twice as likely to be poor as people over the age of 65. That is a political decision, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But here's why it's so stupid, because the brain is growing most rapidly at the time when children are most likely to be poor. This is just basic, dumb human capital investment. So as you can see from this slide, the bulk of brain development begins, in, it happens in the first five years of life, and in fact, in the first three years of life. This is when the brain is growing so rapidly and when it is most sensitive, of course, to environmental inputs. And this is when children are more likely, likely to be poor. So let me take just a little bit more time to talk about what's going on in the brain and why it's so important that we think about these first early years and the impact that high quality environments or for that matter poverty can have in these first early years. We know that the, bo that the brain, that human beings are born with absolutely the most um, undeveloped brains of any species and that's partially because we have to develop such complicated brains and partially because we have to walk upright and there's a limit to how big our heads can be when we're born. But because of this, babies are growing their brains at a phenomenal rate in the first few years of life. The number of neurons, brain cells that are growing is enormous, but what's even more enormous are the connections between brain cells, what's called synapses. Babies are building a million synapses a second. Incon it's just inconceivable how many synapses are being connected. And those synapses are essentially like the pathways between brains, that's how we, between neurons. That's how we send signals and get things done. And what happens over time is babies produce this huge amount of neurons and by three years, that's when you have actually the densest brain in terms of neural synaptic connections. But then you start pruning. And what that means is that the activities and the experiences that you have repeatedly create thick synaptic highways and the things that you don't do or you don't use just wither away. This is why as adults we can drive almost without thinking, which is, all right, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> not all of us, <laughs> some of us, um, sorry about that. Um, 
but we can we can learn we can we can we can read quickly we can but it's very hard for us to learn new languages so in fact the brain becomes more specialized more focused and more efficient as we get older but the opportunities for growth this is when we talk about brain plasticity about the early childhood brain being plastic this is what it means so here's the challenge because in fact babies are born with this opportunity and born with, the, with what we call an experienced expectant brain. So they are actually expecting interactions. That's how the brain figures out everything from the laws of physics to how the world works to who they are. So babies are looking to the interactions that they're having with the natural world and most explicitly and most specifically with, other, with adults to understand how to make sense of their world, and in fact, to put their brain together. Brain architecture happens in the context of interactions, millions and millions of interactions with the everyday world. This is a great opportunity. It's a tremendous opportunity to do all sorts of things. You can teach babies multiple languages in the first, first few years of life. You can teach babies, we do teach babies, all sorts of things about how the world works and who they are and, and, and what is expected of them. They actually also learn how to actually develop their own sense of self-regulation. Babies are born literally with the ability to cry, and that's about it. They can't walk, they can't self-locomote, can't protect themselves in any way. But by crying, they get interactions, and those interactions begin to teach them how to use their, their own brain to calm themselves down and self-regulate. So that's the serve and return that babies are expecting every moment of their day. And when it comes well, it's a beautiful thing. And most of us here in the room, if we've held a baby and we've looked in their eyes, we know exactly what that means and what that feels like. But there are babies who are not getting that on a regular basis. And they're not getting it not because their parents don't love them, but because their parents are probably working two or three jobs. And maybe because their parents are stressed, depressed, and subject to community violence, domestic violence, maybe they're, they have substance abuse. We have children who, by no fault of their own, are essentially being deprived of, a, of, the, tr of the essential interactions that they have to have. And so the children who are born with, um, with in, into the lucky, uh, the lucky gene pool, are building brains that are able to self-regulate, able to uh, manage the future, and, and building an understanding of the world as a place that is safe, predictable, and over which they have agency. Children who aren't in those circumstances, not so much. So we're gonna do a little, this is time for a little interactive learning experience, so everyone needs to raise their right hand. Take your thumb, put it across your palm, that is the amygdala. That is the, the center of the brain. It's the part of the brain that is responsible for emotions. It's where your fight and flight um, uh, um, impulses come from. It's where all the cortisol and all the other adrenaline hormones come out of the amygdala. Now take your other four fingers and put them over your thumb. That's the prefrontal cortex. That's the part of the brain that does learning, memory, impulse control, higher order thinking. So what do you notice? It's all connected, right? The amygdala is touching the prefrontal cortex. You don't get to just turn the amygdala off and use your prefrontal cortex. Um, one of my favorite researchers always says, emotion drives attention and attention drives learning. So think about this in the context of a baby who doesn't have an efficient stress response system. The baby who maybe hasn't been picked up every time he's cried, or maybe when he's picked up, he's yelled at or shaken um, and get, becomes more dysregulated, more frightened. That's a baby whose neural pathways are not turning into super highways that settle him right back down, push the cortisol back into where it goes and, and turn back into a calm resting state that can focus on the next task at hand. That's a baby or a kindergartner or a teenager for whom dysregulation, fear, high alert is always present. That's a child for whom the tiger is always in the room. And when we think about schooling, when we think about 
violence prevention, when we think about all of the enormous tasks of learning that we expect of our young people so that they can become productive citizens, you cannot learn those things if you are worried about your fundamental survival, if you're always on high alert. This is the challenge, and this is, unfortunately, the natural experiment that we have been in for some time. And unfortunately, it's something we can see in the brain with new imaging techniques. We can actually see physical differences in the brain architecture of children who have been raised in traumatic situations from those who have been raised in what we would describe as optimal situations. What we have here is pictures of four-year-old brains. And the circles are around, again, that prefrontal cortex, the part of the brain that I was talking about, higher order thinking, memory, um, everything you need in school. The proliferation of stress hormones, the cortisol and adrenaline that comes out of the amygdala when, 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 any, when all of us um, are, are dysregulated, um, if that's a constant presence in the brain, it actually suppresses the growth of gray matter in the prefrontal cortex. To the extent that it can be seen on, um, on, on uh, scans of the brain, and it can be measured in terms of functional ability. There's some really terrifying research that's come out of Berkeley on middle school and high schoolers who were poor in their first five years of life compared to middle schoolers and high schoolers who were not poor in their first five years of life. And they're given batteries of tests on, you know, memory, um, word association, lots of things having to do with speed of processing. What the researchers have found is a difference between the children who were poor and the children who weren't that's on the order of having had a stroke. So let's just process that for a minute. Here we are focusing on um, the outcomes of kids in um, high, on, on ISATs and on um, high, high school graduation, and we have structural, actually, brain architecture differences that are not going to go away. You can't go back to the critical period and rebuild. It just doesn't happen. And that's why when we look overall at trends in um, development, what we see is that the achievement gap is wide open at age three, and it's pretty persistent through age 18. Now this is um, uh, uh, math. These are achievement scores by maternal education. You can look at the same thing looking at by income quartile. The point is the achievement gap is open by age three. You can measure it at nine months. If you know what you're looking for, you can see it at three months. And it doesn't really move. This doesn't mean that formal schooling isn't important. It just means that our investments in those time are not going to close the achievement gap. So this combination of persistent poverty and increasing need, along with the corresponding sensitivity of the developing brain, is a huge social, moral, and economic challenge for us. We can't continue to pretend that formal schooling is going to close the achievement gap. We can continue to focus on improving K-12 schools, but if we're not thinking about the children and their capacities when they come in, we're always fighting a losing battle. Now, fortunately, there is actually a wide body of research that demonstrates that early interventions do work. Um, this is a list of the um, profound life impacts of um, early childhood interventions, and it's an a, it's a assortment of um, randomized control research that's been done over decades to um, demonstrate the power of investing early and the imp impact of early investments. Many of you have probably seen this slide. If you've ever hung around the ounce, we spent a lot of time with this slide. This is, a, this is actually research that our um, friend Jim Heckman, Nobel Laureate in Economics from the University of Chicago, has done. And actually, uh, Jim came to this work, he's a labor economist, he came to this work because he was asked to unwind the job training programs from the Clinton administrations in the 90s that actually had negative uh, returns on investment, as in the programs cost more than people ever learned from them. 
And just out of idle curiosity or intellectual curiosity, Jim went back and thought, well, where do investments in the life cycle actually have in human capital? When do they have the greatest impact? And he went back all the way back to early childhood. Now, Jim doesn't want to talk about anything after the age of two and parents. That's all he's interested in. And the reason for that is quite clear. It's because, in fact, just as we saw in the brain architecture, it's always great when you know economic research aligns with brain research and scientific research. What we know is that, in fact, all of these things are, have compounding effects. Um, you know, all you finance folks love to talk about compounding, right? So. Um, this, that's essentially what Jim had found, is that skill begets skill. We can see it in the brain architecture. A strong brain builds a brain that can do more, and children actually are compounding the benefits by their own actions. That's why it's so profound to invest in the first couple of years of life, because there's so much opportunity to build on that across the life cycle. And it's interesting, some of this research that's very interesting, and, and I, I think just going back here, you'll see some of these, well, maybe not, yep. You'll see some of these impacts actually are impacts over long periods of life. So one of the things that Jim did is went back to an intervention from the 70s called the Abbasidarian Project, which is a lot like our Educare Project. In fact, I should say our Educare Project is a lot like Abbasidarian because we learned a lot from that. But um, what he went back to find is it's not a health, it was not a health intervention, it was an early childhood education intervention. But he looked at the, at the um, recipients of that when they were in their 40s and 50s, and found tremendous differences in their health outcomes, obesity, diabetes, um, substance abuse, uh, healthy lifestyles, and found that the subjects who had received the intervention were far healthier than the control group. This wasn't because there was anything that was done at that time so much as they actually built more capable, stronger um, lives out of, out of the experience that they had at the beginning. So other research has found that with high quality early childhood experiences, uh, people are more likely to have higher incomes, to own a home, to, to stay out of the criminal justice system, to avoid teen pregnancy, uh, to go on welfare, to need special education. It's a pretty long litany of um, positive outcomes. So this is a really important time. I hope you would agree. And um, here's how we fund it. <laughs> It's a total mess. Um, you know, this is, uh, this is the challenge, you know, if you go back to that interactive learning experience, we don't have separate parts of our body for the family, the health, the brain, um, and yet we have a lot of different funding streams. And for families and for programs, this is how they experience it. Lots of funding streams coming from lots of different directions. The other thing I really, you know, this, w this took us a long time to build this, but um, we're very proud of it. Um, because it also, <laughs> it also um, shows us, in, it's color coded. You can see the red is federal funds, blue is state funds, and the purple are blended funds. So I want to um, take a minute for you all to absorb how much of this is federal funds. Um, what's not on here right now is uh, Medicaid. But it's really important to acknowledge that a third of the um, of, uh, children in our country are on Medicaid and that Medicaid serves pregnant women and babies. And those are really, really important investments. And so we're all very concerned about what's going to happen there. Now, the other challenge here is that no one funding stream serves all of what a family needs. So everybody in our state is blending and braiding funding streams and working with different agencies and different services. There's just a huge amount of work that goes in to putting all this together. Let me take a minute to talk briefly about these funding streams. So first and foremost, well, maybe not. Let's see. Yeah, okay. We have um, the Early Childhood Block Grant. This is a state um, this is a state education um, funding stream. As you can see, it's about almost about $500 million. It's at its highest level ever. Then we have um, home visiting funds and um, early intervention funds. These are also state funds. Um, then we add to that a big enchilada, um, and that is childcare. And childcare is a blend of state and federal funds. Again, we're at our highest levels ever in this. Um, then we have Head Start, which is a federal program, federal to local. And then way up on the top, we have actually seen a, 
significant amount of increase in um, federal funds for early education in the last, um, so it, during the Obama administration, and those are coming to an end, and that will have some significant impact to us as well. What I'm trying to show you here is this is a pretty complicated system. It's a system that depends both on the health of our state and on federal funds. And um, if you put this in the context of the opportunity and the need, it's not nearly enough. So this, I think, is really important for us to think about. Our demographic trends are pushing against all of this. We also know that we're not serving all the children who need the services and that we have much more that we could and should be doing. Now, I want to just put this in the context of our nation because I want us all to feel not terrible about what we're doing in Illinois. We're doing good work in Illinois, but we as a country are making some really dumb choices. And we're, we're, we're actually le being left behind by the rest of the developed world. So this is a slide that shows the investment in early care and education f um, for the United States at 0.4% of GDP versus everybody else. We're down there with Latvia and Turkey. Uh, so that's, uh, that's too bad. And then this is a slide that shows child poverty and overall poverty, again, um, compared to our, um, to many of our neighbors. Again, we're down there in some not great company. Um, but what's really interesting, and the thing that really disturbs me about this is, so the blue bar is child poverty, and the diamond is overall poverty. So here's what makes me sad and sick. Again, our child poverty rate is higher than our overall poverty rate. How awful is that? How stupid is that? Um, and again, we're, we're in not great company in that, in that as well. So um, again, this is a political challenge. When, um, when we want to, we can change the poverty rate. Many of you know we cut the poverty rate of seniors by two-thirds um, over 30 years. But in the um, time from 1969 to 2014, the child poverty rate has actually increased by one-third. We're making political decisions. Um, and just, we should just acknowledge that. Fortunately, there's actually political will. So we have um, had a um, federal advocacy and communications effort based in Washington for the last 10 years. And um, over the last four years, we've been doing polls, asking people whether they're actually, what, how, what, what they think we should be doing, our country should be doing in terms of investment in early education. We're proud to say that this is an issue that transcends political party. It actually transcends all kinds of demographics. There is really strong support for investment in early education. So we just have to get it done. Um, and it's not just about money. And this is one of the things I do want to talk about. Here in Illinois, we have done a great job of building an early childhood system. And it's, it's been due to the work of many in this room and many of the foundations that have supported early childhood education for a very long time. We've had a shared set of principles, not just about serving um, the most at risk, but about serving the most at risk with evidence-based, high-quality programs and supporting all of the infrastructure, professional development, research, data systems that support high-quality investments. And that has been, again, an ongoing public-private effort. We're proud to say that early childhood education has, been, has received great bipartisan support here in Illinois for decades. And that's very, very important, and it's why we have as, as good a system as we do. But there's so much more to do. So at the ounce, we are, as, um, as Ed mentioned, a public-private partnership. We are solely focused on children in poverty from before birth through age five. But we work in all of these spheres because we know that it actually takes program development, it takes professional development, it takes advocacy and policy, it takes ongoing research and continuous quality improvement, and all of the work to pull this system together and to make this a high quality system. But babies can't wait. Every day, a million synapses, every, every second. Every day, there are, every fall, we have, um, 
children going into kindergarten who aren't ready to succeed. And we owe it to them to make sure, and to us and to our future, to make sure that we allow them to succeed. So thanks very much. I'll stop here. Uh, this is from Karen Retan, City Club member, uh, with the Public Health Institute of Metropolitan Chicago. What do you think the long-term, next five years, impact of the budget impasse will be on social services in Illinois? Well, obviously, social services in Illinois have been um, under tremendous pressure over the last couple of years. And, um, but I would also say social service programs have been under tremendous pressure for at least a decade. Um, I, I know that um, we've been at the ounce uh, through a few cycles of late payments over the last decade. And uh, we are all, I think, hopeful for a long-term solution that provides um, the proper funding for the social service programs that need it. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is from Robin Steens with the Steens Family Foundation. <clears throat> Has any state managed to streamline funding to more effectively support early childhood programs? Robin, you said you were going to give me easy questions. <laughs> That's, That's Robin, you know, you can always <laughs> count on her. <laughs> That's not fair. Yes. I would say that um, uh, there are states that have um, tried to integrate uh, their funding um, streams and to integrate to create offices of early childhood development that bring more of those funding streams together. Now, um, some of the programs, like Head Start, are, gonna, are federal to local, and there's no getting around that. Um, we have, I think, over the last few years, um, with the creation of the Office of Early, Governor's Office of Early Childhood Development, tried to in, ensure greater collaboration, but there's a lot more to do to, in, to ensure that the agencies are working together. And the hard work happens at the state level instead of at the local level. So there's a lot more we can do. And, and there are um, states like Connecticut and Pennsylvania that have um, experimented with mob models. And, and we at the Early Learn Learning Council, I should make you answer this, Phyllis. <laughs> Um, I, uh, ha are, we're looking at, at other opportunities for how we can how we can do that. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Remember that was Robin Steen, S-T-E-A-N. Okay. This is from uh, Lee Rubenstein with the Civic Leadership Foundation. Metrics for organizations dealing within the realm of socio-emotional issues are difficult. Any suggestions on how to address this? when facing funders. Yeah, no, I think that's really true. You know, it's, we always, um, we value what we can measure and it's much easier to measure uh, vocabulary or achievement test scores than it is to measure um, social emotional development. There are actually newer ways of measuring that um, and we, are, we have tried some of those. There are also good proxies, you know, um, attendance is a pretty good measure of how parents and children are doing. Um, so there are behavioral measures that matter a lot, but it's an area actually that needs, that continues to need, need research without question. Okay, the question is from Joe Gomez, right down here, who writes left-handed, by the way. How is the use of telephone, cell phone games affecting children's development? Ooh, ooh, okay. How much time do we have? All right, so this is actually a really important issue, and it's important for two reasons. First, because, you know, there was this idea that somehow baby Mozart was going to be a great way to raise kids, and it turns out that it has absolutely no effect. So if you were at our annual luncheon, shameless plug for our annual luncheon, um, you would have heard from a renowned a neuro, uh, brain um, scientist, uh, Pat Cool, who has done research on how children learn language or even the sounds of languages, Turns out, kids don't learn anything unless there's eye contact involved. So a child in front of um, a television or a computer screen um, will not absorb anything, um, even if it's exactly the same material that is presented by a live human being, or for you grandparents out there, if you're on Skype with your grandchild, it still works. But it's absolutely, absolutely true. Now why is this? Because in fact, this is, brains are very, very sophisticated. These, brain, these babies have, that are 
building these brains are huge. They're, they're basically statistical processors. They're getting all of these inputs, and they're just doing what a super, supercomputer does and thinking about what's the most um, frequent thing that's happening. Well, that must be the, the thing that I'm focusing on. So it's their frequency modulators. But they only turn the computer on when they have eye contact. So social interaction is a gateway for brain development. Without that, nothing's happening. They're not paying attention. That's number one. The other qu part of your question, though, which is the really saddest part, and this is also something you can see on some pretty scary films, is what happens when adults disassociate. And um, I'm very pleased that not many of you are on your cell phone right now, but all of us have a really bad habit of looking at that thing and kind of going away from wherever we are in the present. And it's kind of fine when you're sitting next to your spouse who's old enough to tell you to stop. <laughs> but if you go into McDonald's, or I'm not picking on McDonald's, go into a, anywhere where you see parents with very, very young children, and sometimes pre-verbal children, and you see the parent on her cell phone, and that child is going to make a bid for attention. And sometimes the bid for attention will be something that the parent doesn't want. So that level of attunement that is missing because mom's gone, gone away and child is trying to get her back leads to some pretty unpleasant interactions because children act out when they want attention. And so when we think about, you know, we're all guilty of this, um, and I don't know about you, but my kids sometimes say, get off your cell phone. It's easy to do when you're 20, harder to do when you're two. Um, that's probably more than you want to hear, but it's, it's a serious problem. And we think about that because we know, again, everything I just said about social interaction, and then you have this device that literally sucks social interaction out of the way for adults. And adults are the ones that have to do this with kids. So. Well, Joe, that's a lot of food for thought there. So. Don't give your three-year-old that cell phone. Make him wait a few years. Okay. Um, Diane, one of the points that you made was the um, tremendous number of people involved and the need for um, early intervention and programs at the zero to five level. Yet it seems that a lot of the people who work in that area are so low on the pay scale and the preparation. Any thoughts about how we yeah. could change some of that? Well, that is the workforce is a huge challenge, and it is a challenge because it is an under undercapitalized workforce, undereducated, underpaid. And um, again, when I went back to those funding streams, they're all paying for just just kind of enough. But we have to actually increase the funding on that and the availability of of funds to support high quality early learning in our state. We have, over many years, and with a lot of advocacy, raised the credentials required of um, teachers who work in um, state-funded preschool programs, whether they're in the schools or in, um, in community-based programs. And that has also led to an increase in pay. In, um, in the home visiting space, we have, um, we've actually used our federal dollars to try to raise, to set a floor for the payment of home visitors for the for the salary a salary floor. Now all of these are small incremental efforts. They're not nearly enough. But this is the way we have to do this. We have to continue to push up the um, the the pay grade because we need to bring better people, more people, and 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 people who will, can stay in the field and get better at what they do for these kids. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we just have a couple more questions here. Uh, this is from Neil Nosen. Entrepreneur, I love that. <clears throat> Would you please explain why, in your opinion, infant mortality is so high in the United States? Okay, I'll do my best because this is not actually an area of expertise for me, but I do care quite a bit about it, and I know a little bit. So the problem with infant mortality in our state, in our country, is a lot like um, some of the other problems that we just showed, that where we just looked at. There's huge, huge disparities in um, infant mortality. So. Um, we have um, infant mortality differences by race and geography and income that are extraordinary. Um, and we have 
capacity problems with respect to that. Um, here in our state, uh, there's a tremendous lack of supports for high-risk pregnancies south of, um, in the southern half of our state, and that's a big challenge. Again, going back to the question of um, capacity and where are the people and with the need versus where is the infrastructure, that's a big challenge. Um, but um, infant mortality is a tremendous challenge, again, that's related to poverty and related to the disparities that we have in, um, in services for, for, for children and families. Thank you, Diana. This is from Kathy Carmody, the Institute on Public Policy for People with Disabilities. Thank you for the presentation. I know we all share that. Can you comment on how social service organizations across Illinois can work collaboratively rather than competitively to support populations in need? Well, I think one of the things we're very um, hopeful for is that the more community level collaboration we can get, the better. The more we can think about um, communities, uh, in a sense, not competing for clients, but rather having coordinated intake and coordinated uh, referral systems, uh, the better. And that's a big focus of some of the work that we've been trying to do in piloting across the country, across the state. Great. Final question. From Dr. Sonia Boone with the Feinberg School of Medicine at Northwestern University. Where are you, Dr. Boone? Great. Could you discuss how the mental health of mothers are addressed and what programs are being accelerated to improve health and mental health in a short period of time? <laughs> well, that's a really important question, and it's mental health of mothers and also mental health of teachers and the caregivers who are working with kids. Um, we know that, um, that Many, I think uh, some of the research suggests that as many as 50% of mothers um, in, um, who qualify for Head Start are depressed. And a depressed mother is obviously a risk factor for all sorts of developmental issues because of the response, need for responsiveness. So it's a really important issue. And it's one of the things that um, we know that home visiting programs and other programs that work directly with families can provide is support for mental health needs and referral but again, we tend not to have the capacity to serve all those that need it, and so we have to do more to provide those supports and those services. Um, one of the things that we're most proud of in our state is we are a leader in early childhood mental health services, and we have, thanks to the leadership of the Irving Harris Found Foundation, we have um, in our state really piloted and developed the use of early childhood mental health consultants in. Um, in early childhood programs that can work with teachers and with families to help um, to help children who are usually little canaries in the coal mine in terms of their behavior um, um, support their development and their behavior behavioral health. Thank, let's everybody let's give Diana Rauner a big round of applause. Thank you so much. Don't leave. Don't leave. Next, from Springfield, we talked to Taylor Pensenow, a former reporter with the St. Louis Post-Dispatch who covered Illinois politics, about his recollections of certain Illinois politicians, why nothing is getting done in Springfield, the effect of Illinois political power being concentrated in Chicago, and his advice for aspiring journalists. This runs about one hour. Taylor Pensenow, thank you for joining us on the Illinois Channel. Glad to be here with you, Terry. It's been a while since we spoke. You are, uh, for the audience, uh, just to remind you, started out uh, some 50-something years ago as a young reporter covering Illinois politics for the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. Right. Subsequently worked uh, as the head of the Coal Association and for mm -hmm. the last, uh, what, 15 or so years have been an author and, and mm -hmm. produced a number of books. That's right. Some That's of the historical right. figures that you covered mm -hmm. as a reporter. Right. Right. We thought it would be interesting as we uh, look toward the bicentennial of the state mm -hmm. of Illinois and, and celebrate 200 years that you you covered a significant uh, chapter uh, and people who were significant in the development of where we are today. Absolutely. Uh, during your time as a reporter, we had this current state constitution written. Mm -hmm. uh, technology, as everyone knows, as far as the technology of reporting, is greatly mm -hmm. transformed. 
yeah. journalism. Let's start off just uh, in the beginning. Let's let's go back to when was it that you started reporting for the St. Louis Post Dispatch? I came to the Post Dispatch, Terry, in 1962, right after graduation from the University of Missouri School of Journalism, and um, I was uh, for three years uh, a general assignment reporter uh, on the streets of St. Louis for the Post Dispatch, and then in 1965, the Post decided to reactivate a dormant bureau in the, in the press room in the Illinois State House and they gave me an opportunity to fill that role. It was a terrific uh, opportunity for a young guy, 24, 25 years old. And uh, I started here in October of 1965, and for 12 years uh, I was the Illinois political writer for the Post-Dispatch uh, up until early 1978 when I left the Post-Dispatch. I left Big City Daily Journalism and accepted an offer to go to work for the Illinois coal mining industry. When you were covering in the 60s, and again, what year did you just say you left uh, the daily reporting? Uh, early 1978. So you had covered uh, Otto Kerner uh, as governor. Uh, did, you, did you cover any of uh, Bill Scranton as governor? I did not. I got to know Bill Scranton, but I, I never covered him. No, yeah, Otto that, Kerner was I, governor. I, I misspoke. That's a, that may have misspoke. <laughs> Otto Kerner was governor when I arrived on the scene here. Uh huh. Um, Let's start with Otto Kerner, right. uh, who later went to jail. We talk, we joke, uh, kind of black humor about how many governors have gone to jail. A number of the governors who have gone to jail went to jail not as for what they did during their governorship necessarily, but some did and some didn't. Well, one didn't, Dan Walker. Dan Walker. The others all went to jail. To jail. Tied to their well, because of their governmental uh, governor, activities. Governor George Ryan was more for what the Secretary of State, though. Oh, okay, yeah. It was still a governmental situation, though. Yeah. But Dan Walker, his situation was completely divorced from his being governor of Illinois. Right. Yeah. Uh, Otto Kerner, what kind of a governor was Otto Kerner? What kind of a man was he? Otto Kerner was um, a, a genteel, debonair individual, uh, always wore vested suits, very distinguished. Uh, was a um, uh, was a scholar in, in every sense of the word. Uh, had been a military a top military officer. Uh, he, he he demanded respect, and uh, I was very impressed with him as an individual when I first arrived. And I was very young, Terry, and I was impressionable at the start. Okay, but uh, Kerner was, um, uh, as I said, he he he, he demanded respect. Uh, I, uh, I, I got to know him, of course, uh, to some degree. Uh, he was not close to the press. Uh, he didn't like press conferences, and he didn't like to answer questions from the press. Uh, he quickly would go on the defensive, I noticed, in his r rare press conferences and so on. But one-on-one, uh, -on -one, I found him to be fairly um, cooperative and, 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 and conducive to taking questions and so on. Uh, I was very, very uh, disappointed later on in life as were many other people, when he uh, ran into trouble uh, on, a si on a situation that occurred while he was still governor, but wasn't disclosed until a number of years later. It involved his acceptance of, in a, in a secret uh, deal of, of, of racing track stock uh, in exchange for uh, influencing the awarding of favorable, favorable racing dates to, uh, to a Chicago uh, uh, family that had one of the big tracks up there. I think it was Arlington Park, mm -hmm. and that was a, a that was a stunner, and uh, that was the uh, beginning of the modern era of governors uh, being convicted of uh, felons, felonies, and going and going to jail. Kerner was the first. Actually, Stratton of the last eleven Illinois governors, five have been indicted uh, for, for for criminal activity. Of those five, four uh, uh, were, were were convicted. Uh, the one who wasn't convicted was William Stratton, uh, a Republican who was governor in the 1950s. And after leaving the governorship, Stratton was indicted for income tax evasion, but he was acquitted at a, at a trial, so he, he obviously did not go to jail. The other four, Kerner, Dan Walker, uh, George Ryan, and Rod Lagojevich, all were convicted of, of the charges against them and all went to, uh, went to prison. And we had, well, I mean, uh, others, I mean, Governor Edgar, there was, uh, I don't want to, I want to say this politely because 
uh, he was never accused, but there, there was a trial with one of uh, uh, some of his supporters. I mean, so we get the point I would make is we get into these situations where issues come up. And one of the things that I would ask you, it, it's not that we want anyone to be engaged in criminal activity of any sort. Of course not. But are we... Are we having these governors, in your estimation, uh, as you said, five of the last, what, 11? 11. Um, is that because people are more corrupt these days, or do you think the corruption was always there, but we now are just holding governors, we're not looking the other way any longer? I think you've kind of answered your own question. Um, I think the governors are under much more scrutiny now than they were. And there's always been a corruption factor at the highest levels of Illinois government. And that's true with most other states. But Illinois seems to have attracted a lot of attention for, uh, for, for corruption uh, at its highest level. Uh, I think that is because of several reasons. In Illinois, we've always had, a, we've had aggressive U.S. attorneys in, in Chicago. And, uh, you know, people can often name U.S. attorneys in Chicago because they make names for themselves by indicting high officials, be it members of the Chicago Democratic Machine, be it Illinois governors, or what have you. Uh, in a lot of other places in the United States, no one knows who the U.S. Attorney is because uh, they don't make names for themselves by indicting high government officials. So Illinois, uh, the corruption factor has been accentuated by the fact that we've had aggressive United States attorneys in Chicago, Jim Thompson being one, of course, obviously. Jim Thompson right. what became famous now, because he had indicted uh, Otto, Kerner. Otto Kerner. Exactly. Now, he was a federal judge, we should say. Kerner had been appointed to the federal bench yeah, by Lyndon federal, Johnson. Federal federal judge. Right. Incredible. Now, um, I also want to point out, though, to buttress what you just said a minute ago, that the behavior and the practices of some past governors uh, are no longer being tolerated. And George Ryan is a good example. Uh, many, uh, uh, I don't want to say apologists, but backers of George Ryan have said that he didn't do anything that a lot of his predecessors didn't do. And there is some truth to that, Terry, that... Uh, they changed the rules they, of the game they, on him, right? They changed the rules, and George got caught in the middle of the stream, as they say because some of the things for which he was indicted have been going on for years under, uh, under other uh, top Illinois officials, be they governors or secretaries of, of state or treasurers or what have you, attorney, attorney generals. But uh, the U.S. Attorney in Chicago decided to draw the line on George, on George Ryan and make an example of him, and of course he did. And that doesn't excuse the fact that George Ryan was convicted of um, a, a number of uh, federal charges in respect to his governorship, and, and as you said, going back to his years as Secretary of State, but at the same time, some of the things for which Ryan was convicted were, uh, were obviously practices in past administrations, and, 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 and the numbers of those individuals were never called. As you who have been involved in reporting on public mm -hmm. policy right. uh, for 50 years, is Illinois deserving of its reputation as one of the most corrupt states, or are we somehow just where we've changed the rules of the game and therefore all of a sudden we're filtering people through a different uh, prism than we did before? I think, unfortunately, Illinois is deserving of its reputation as a relatively corrupt state. Uh, I was not pleased, as were others, when uh, Governor Bogoyevich was indicted and a top FBI official uh, stood at a press conference, conference in Chicago and said, because of this indictment and because of other things we're looking into in Illinois, uh, Illinois may be surpassing Louisiana as the most corrupt state in the United States. Louisiana has a terrible reputation for corruption at the highest level. And for Illinois to be finally compared to Louisiana, uh, I thought was the, uh, was the epitome of uh, of a blackballing, blacklisting Illinois in, in, in terms of governmental corruption. You know, in fact, uh, uh, a number of years ago, I was talking to Larry Sabato, the mm -hmm. uh, political science right. professor at the University of Virginia, right. uh, when I was in Washington, and he said, I put Illinois right up there with Mississippi and Louisiana for the most corrupt state in the nation. He, he included was, Mississippi, huh? Yeah. That's unusual. I don't hear Mississippi included as much as, uh, not as much as Louisiana.
Which, uh, and of course, Louisiana sent some of their own, like Edwin Edwards, uh, some of their own governors, oh, uh, past yeah. governors, to jail. Oh, yeah, right. Uh, and the Kingfish from back in the 30s. Uh, Huey Long, right. Huey Long. Uh, I, I don't want to run through, I mean, just we could spend all, all day just talking individually about different people uh, and governors, but it's not just governors. There are significant people in the legislature. Uh, when you look back over a 50-year period, who are some of the personalities that stand out, and, and why do they stand out? Well, I would think that probably, uh, just to get to the heart of it, uh, of the governors I either covered or knew or dealt with in one way or another, uh, I think Richard Ogilvy was frankly the most outstanding governor in my time. I think he will go down uh, as one of the great governors uh, in Illinois history. Uh, just bouncing around, uh, James Thompson was incredibly uh, charismatic and was able to rise above partisan politics and pretty much get whatever he wanted out of government. He could get whatever he wanted out of well, He was a Republican, but a very moderate Republican, uh, a, a middle-of-the-road Republican, and he could get whatever he wanted out of, the, uh, out of the Democrats. And then you look at George Ryan. George Ryan, if not for his downfall on the federal uh, prosecution and, and sub subsequent conviction, George Ryan might have gone down as one of our best governors because he pretty much could get whatever he wanted uh, out of the General Assembly. Uh, he could reach across the aisle, although Republican, and get Democratic support for whatever he wanted. He had a close relationship at the time with Mayor Daley, the second Mayor Daley of Chicago. Uh, they were very close, and, and they had a good working relationship. How was relationship. his relationship with Mike Madigan? You know? uh, it was passable. It was passable. Uh, uh, George Ryan uh, uh, was an old-fashioned wheeler dealer. Uh, he came up the hard way through the uh, uh, hardball politics of Kankakee County and, and, and knew the ropes before he ever got to Springfield. And he could deal. He could deal with, uh, with, with top Democrats. And, and Mike Madigan would be included in that. I think they liked each other. And... Um, uh, he, 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 he dealt with Mike Madigan. So you had Jim Thompson, moderate Republican. Jim Edgar uh, would, Jim, would be Jim a moderate Edgar Republican a, as well. Jim, right? Jim Edgar was a very uh, moderate Republican. Uh, uh, Jim Edgar was um, uh, uh, a, a governmental practitioner. He, he, of course, had been a legislator, and then he had worked for Thompson as his legislative liaison and, 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 and so on. And Jim Edgar... Uh, uh, new politics. Uh, Jim Edgar, I think, was an exceptionally decent individual to have reached the highest rung of Illinois politics. Uh, uh, I thought he was basically a, a nice guy, a nice gentleman. Uh, I, I've known him, knew him for years, of course. And uh, I think Jim Edgar was a case of, uh, of, of an exceptionally uh, decent, uh, personally corrupt free individual reaching the highest level of, of politics in Illinois. Uh, he was, he was also... He was, a, but he was not a backslapper, and he was not, to a lot of people, a warm individual. He was rather formal, and uh, uh, he, uh, uh, unlike George Ryan and unlike Jim Thompson, uh, it would be an exaggeration, though, to say that Jim could get whatever he wanted out of Democrats because, because that, wasn't, that wasn't true. Uh, I, I know that... Uh, I used to try to follow his relationship with Madigan, and I think it was hot and cold, uh, but, but it wasn't well, the same uh, relationship. Well, I'll insert that, that uh, Governor uh, Edgar has said that during the four, first four years, he, right. he served eight, uh, that Madigan was a constant thorn in his side, but right. for, he goes, for some reason, uh, Madigan took pity on me. I may have <laughs> been putting words in his mouth, but, but they, their relationship warmed up during the last four I years. I think that's true. Yeah. I observe that, and I think that's true, that um, 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 basically Madigan and Edgar could work out uh, solutions to major problems, major issues affecting the state. Uh, and I know that uh, uh, I don't think there was any love lost between the two because they were entirely different individuals in terms of where they came from and, and, and culture-wise and so on. But, but basically, uh, uh, Edgar, I think, uh, was a live-and-let-live individual and uh, a pragmatic fellow and, and basically uh, uh, did a good job as governor of Illinois. Uh, uh, there was the one scandal that, 
but but I should point out that it did not touch him. It did not personally. tank Governor Reagan. And that, right. you got to, you know, it did not. No, no, right. no. And, and you got to point that out. Right. And 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 no governorship is free of uh, of a. Uh, of one or more scandals, as we know, but uh, but well, but and then anyone can raise Jim, an Jim, issue, Jim, right? Jim, I mean, they they yeah. investigate in. Jim Edgar gets high marks as a decent individual who who did a good job and 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 ran a responsible uh, government, uh, both financially and in dealing with issues and so on. The other thing about Governor Edgar uh, was he was a downstater. He was from right. Charleston right. area, and. Does that make a difference? I mean, we often hear about the divide between Chicago and downstate. Downstate virtually being anything besides Chicago and the collar counties. Right. When you go to Chicago, there is such a focus on the city and the city politics. It is very easy to fall into that mindset yeah. that you live in the state of Chicago. No, that's true. Uh, and then there's just this rest of this landmass that we call Illinois. Right. Does it matter? In your estimation, that a governor is a downstater versus someone from the Chicago land area. When we look at the history of governors, so many of them are from Chicago. Right. Well, I think it does matter. There's a there, there's a historical cultural divide in Illinois between the greater Chicago area and the rest of Illinois, so-called downstate, and it has always governed the way issues are addressed, the way government is conducted, and so on. And a downstater as governor. Uh, is is which we don't. It's hard to see again as we sit here today. Uh, a downstater as governor sees things differently than a Chicagoan. You already said uh, Chicago political leaders have a difficult time seeing a part of Illinois. I say south of I-80 around Joliet. Joliet is downstate to these guys. Okay, <laughs> and and I think that there's always been. Uh, a, a traditional downstate versus Chicago divide in Illinois. I think it's getting more pronounced. Uh, Chicago is gaining the upper hand in the situation because of the population disparity. You know, roughly 70 percent of the people in Illinois now live in the greater Chicago area, and the demographics are no, are no longer there for downstate political uh, uh, individuals to to exercise the say that they that they once did. Uh, there was a time when downstate could hold its own against Chicago in terms of political bargaining in the governmental scene in Illinois, in the General Assembly, and in other ways. But we really don't have that anymore. Uh, Chicagoans are in a position where they can pretty much ramrod through anything they want now because they really don't need to bargain and get downstate votes on issues. And I think that's rather unfortunate. Uh, it, what, why does it matter? Well, I think it I mean, matters, as a practical because, it matters sense. because the constituents of, of, of downstate politicians, be they legislators or what have you, uh, really don't care about heavy financing of Chicago public schools, for example, or subsidizing mass transit in the Chicago area. Uh, and, and there was a time when, uh, and, and, and Chicagoans, for the most part, really uh, uh, could care less about poverty-stricken economic uh, Areas suffering downturns in, in in much of downstate Illinois and so on, and they don't and they don't identify with a lot of downstate issues, be it agriculture or coal mining or or or, or what have you. Uh, and I think that as long as we had some some semblance of balance between the two, uh, they, things could be worked out. But you know, downstate had a lot of political individuals who could deal with Chicago. And don't laugh when I say Paul Powell was one. Paul Powell did a lot of good for downstate Illinois in spite of the way he, his reputation ended up. Uh, but downstate doesn't have the Paul Powells anymore. It doesn't have the Clyde Schultz. And it doesn't have, uh, uh, we don't have governors from, from downstate. And so it's, it's very difficult for downstate to get, in my opinion, fair representation in the halls of the State House. Uh, there are many parts of Illinois that, uh, not just Chicagoans, but uh, other downstaters don't know anything about. You've got counties in western Illinois in the so-called Fregatonia area that a lot of people couldn't even tell you what the names of the counties are, what the county seats are. Well, I, I often there? point out to people, when's the last time we ever heard any news from Galesburg or mm -hmm. Effingham right. or Mattoon? Right. I mean, there are hundreds of communities across this state right. 
that might as well be on the dark side of the moon as far exactly. as the coverage that we ever hear of exactly. life in those communities. Exactly, exactly. And, and as more and more of them are being represented by Republicans, that doesn't necessarily help their status in terms of the high-level dealing at the state level where you've got Democrats dominating, dominating the House, dominating the Senate, and dominating elective offices, although right now we do have a Republican governor, uh, uh, Rauner. But, you know, the, the, we're getting into a classic divide where Chicago, of course, is a democratic behemoth, if that's the right word. Uh, but, but downstate is becoming more, it's always been Republican, but now it's becoming even more Republican than it was. And, but, but again, th this is interesting, but, but yet it's, it's not favorable for downstate in terms of dealing at the state level because we don't have the people and I get we don't have the demographics to compete with and, and sit at a table with Chicagoans. And so, you know, we have this divide, basically, in, in kindergarten language, Democratic Chicago, Republican downstate, but it's not as simple as that. Democratic Chicago right now holds all the aces in their hand if we're playing poker or whatever. Yeah, I will, I will point out, because, I mean, as you and I talk sometimes when I do an interview, and this is one of them, I, I think of people watching this 50 years from now. Uh -huh. uh, I would point out that in the election of 2010, when we had Bill Brady, the Republican candidate for governor, right. running against uh, uh, Pat Quinn, right. who was a sitting governor, but anyway, he, uh, Bill Brady won, I think, 99 out of 102 counties right. and lost the election. Right. So it goes to show how concentrated the political power is. And my point would be that Illinois has a geographic problem. Because Absolutely. when you look at the political players that matter, there's only about five people in the state that hold significant political power. That's right. The, the governor, the president of the Senate, the speaker of the House, the president of Cook County, and the mayor of Chicago. And throw in the assessor of Cook County just for fun. That's uh, <laughs> yes, okay. People often ask me as an aside here, who, who are the most powerful individuals? What are the top most three most powerful offices in, in, in Illinois? And I have an answer, and it's not a total joke. Number one, Mayor of Chicago. Number two, the assessor of Cook County. And Number, why do you say that? Oh, the assessor of Cook County gets to appraise all the values of all the. Uh, uh, all the, the property to be taxed. And the properties in Chicago, and gosh, look at what we're talking about. And number three, governor. Well, that's and, kind of a joke. And, and, and I don't mean this as a slight to any of the people currently in office. Right. But when you have this much concentration of power, right. Uh, if you're the minority leader in the House or Senate, yeah, you're not really. Uh, you have the title, but you don't have the political power to affect change. You do not. Not as we sit here today. Uh, in um, uh, early 2017, uh, what you said is exactly right. We do not have a, a balance of power in, in either chamber, legislative chamber, that really is necessary to, to address issues in a, in a fair way that takes into account the, the concerns and needs of all parts of the state, not just the greater Chicago area. I grew up in St. Louis. You worked for the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, right. as we said. I often point out in this regard that if you were from the man, the proverbial man from Mars and were trying to find a place to colonize, you would point out to your boss, I found a place in the richest nation on earth on the biggest river in, in that uh, <laughs> country, smack dab north, south, east, west in the middle of the country. Right. It has a heavy rail light rail, barge traffic, major highways going right past it, right. And, and major airports. And uh, that's great. What is it? East St. Louis. <laughs> and it's true. I know. I and yet know. East St. Louis, for those who haven't been there, sits there and rots. Uh, it it yeah. is an economic development officer's dream in many ways, right. as far as what right. assets are there to work with. Right. Right. And, and to, I would argue that this is a reflection that it sits there and rots of the concentration of power being so much in Chicago with the Chicago blinders right. on what issues matter that no one cares about in East St. Louis. And, and it's reflective, not to make it just about East St. Louis, 
But when you can overlook something like that and have it sitting there rotting right. for decades, right. it is reflective of the imbalance of power and how that manifests itself in a practical sense in life right. in, in Illinois right. at this point I, in time. I, ironically, you mentioned East St. Louis. Of course, I had to pay particular attention to East St. Louis in my reporting years for the Post-Dispatch, obviously. Right. And in my years, uh, one governor went out of his way uh, to try to help East St. Louis and temporarily did a lot of good for the city, and that was Republican uh, Richard Ogilvie. And that's unusual because Ogilvy uh, did far more to address the real problems of East St. Louis than, uh, than any other governor in, 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 in my lifetime. And um, What did he do and why did it? Well, he, 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 for example, he set up, uh, author, he, he pushed through legislation to, to create a community college in East St. Louis that uh, didn't get any local funds. It was, it was totally financed by the state. That was most unusual. The only uh, uh, higher educational institution, it was a two-year community college that didn't uh, depend on local taxes. There were no taxes assessed for it. That would have been an example. He, he went along with a lot of uh, building projects in East St. Louis, capital projects that, that, that weren't done. On that, he cooperated with the federal government and so on. Uh, he did uh, other things. Uh, he appointed uh, 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 East St. Louisans to, to, to key positions, and he gave uh, the city a degree of respect in regard to, to, uh, to, to, the, to the people coming out of it and so on. He was there a lot. Uh, for a while, uh, East St. Louis had a Republican mayor while Ogilvy was governor. And uh, uh, he did a lot to try to ease. He addressed the, the uh, racial relations in East St. Louis. And it was going through a catharsis at the time, a, 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 uh, a, uh, a violent transformation from being a, a biracial city to one that is essentially uh, all black. Uh, but that was not an easy thing to handle and, and deal with. And Ogilvy did a good job there, as, as good as he could at the time. Uh, and the of course, point, we should point out he was a one-term governor. And he was a one-term governor, good point. <coughs> and, and, and since then, no governor, uh, in, in, in my estimation, has given East St. Louis any, uh, any extraordinary consideration nothing out of the ordinary, and East St. Louis has continued to, to plummet to a de dehabilitation, and what we have today is, is one of the major uh, uh, decrepit eyesores among municipalities in the United States. There's many things you're a fascinating guy, and there's a lot of issues, and I, I, we're never going to have enough time. No. But, so I want to move along just to some other uh, areas. Again, you started out as a journalist. You've been covering these these issues. Uh, you've written books. You mm -hmm. biographer of Governor Ogilvie, mm -hmm. so you're well informed. And also of Russell Arrington, right. who is a major Republican senator and a powerhouse. Um, tell us, tell us just briefly, and I, I want to get into the state of journalism a bit as well. Right. But who was Russell Arrington, and why did he matter? Russell Arrington uh, was uh, one of life's great success stories. Uh, poor kid, grew up poor, uh, uh, born in Gillespie, Illinois, actually, uh, who, who made it big as a lawyer uh, in Chicago, became a, uh, a wealthy lawyer uh, during the Depression years in the 1930s when he became very schooled with handling bank foreclosures and bank failures and things like that. Got involved in politics. Uh, <clears throat> Republican politics as a young man up on the North Shore and uh, eventually decided, was a big success as a lawyer, was a big success in business, but decided he wanted more. And uh, he ran for and eventually got elected to the Illinois House in, in, in 1944, uh, served 10 years in the House and then got elected to the State Senate in the mid-50s. And it was there that he really came into his own uh, he decided to make his mission in public life to, his mission was to make the General Assembly a more meaningful branch of government. And Arrington, uh, who was a very um, cold, callous individual. Uh, but not was, warm and fuzzy. Huh? Not warm and fuzzy, oh no, anything but. And very mercurial, uh, very hot-tempered and so on decided when he was at the helm in the Senate, he then was at the helm of a big Republican majority 
in the state senate. They could pretty much do what it wanted. He decided then to forge and and drag the General Assembly into the 20th century and make it a more meaningful part of government. For example, the General Assembly only met uh, every other year. It was a biennial situation. Arrington was the one who brought about annual sessions of the General Assembly. Arrington was the one who forged annual budgeting. Arrington was the one who, for the first time, made the General Assembly run on time. Committees met when they said when they were going to meet. They reported out bills. He imposed deadlines that were met and so on. He actually turned the General Assembly into a... Uh, into From a fraternity a, house a, into a, a professional a organization. Into, into, into a professional organization. And it did become a much more important part of Illinois, of Illinois uh, government on a day-to-day -day basis. He wanted it to be more functioning on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, a lot of people argued with this, of course, and felt that wasn't the intent of the General Assembly. Well, can but, I interject? Used he, to was, be he was the one who made what we now have in Illinois a full-time General Assembly, a full-time legislature. I was going to say, uh, the lawmakers pay, am I not right? They used to get their entire salary on the first day? I, I guess I've heard that. I'm not sure about that. And then, so they didn't necessarily the, feel that they had to come in. The pay wasn't very much. Or come all the way you. down to Springfield. Uh, <laughs> no. These no. days, well, as we speak, they're not even getting right. paid on time. But no, uh, uh, that's somewhat... Uh, let me but let me it, say this. Uh, but it, it, Arrington ran, though, the Senate with an iron hand. Did he ever want to be governor? He talked about it, but he was never sincere about it. For one thing, he had this prickly personality, and he would not have been a good campaigner. Um, uh, he wouldn't suffer fools gladly. Huh? Oh, you couldn't put it any better. In fact, that's a phrase I, 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 I'm his biographer, of course, and I put in there that he did not suffer fools lightly. And uh, it didn't matter whether you were a fellow Republican or a Democrat or an Independent. If, if you screwed you up, Arrington he'd was you merciless know. in coming down <laughs> on you. And, and he always did it in front of everybody. He didn't, he didn't do behind the scenes. I was a reporter in those years, Terry, and I would be sitting in the Senate press gallery covering it. And you always knew if it was a slow day covering the Senate, you were going to have a story uh, to write before it was over, thanks to Arrington, the Republican leader, who was running the, the show from, his, from the floor. And Arrington would, uh, if someone screwed up or someone was out of line or someone hadn't done what he or she was supposed to do, Arrington would give them a tongue lashing in front of everybody, fellow Republicans, Democrats, and so on. The joke was Arrington always had a big cigar, okay? And there was a tip-off. If the cigar, if he had the cigar in his mouth and it started going up and down in a nervous fashion, that was wonderful because you knew somebody was in for, for, for a tongue lashing. Somebody had screwed up, and that was the clue, clue that Arrington was ready to lash out to somebody. And everybody, sent, uh, the, all the other senators would be looking down at their desk, no one wanted to look up, and, because no one wanted to be the, the, the target of his tongue lashing. But no, Arrington succeeded partly because people were afraid of him. Uh, he was a, a multimillionaire. He didn't need the money. He wasn't on the take, but he was uh, uh, very arrogant and very demanding and so on and and for a time uh, under Arrington the uh, the General Assembly uh, ran like a very smooth machine back in his time in fact uh, Speaker Madigan uh, had told me in, in, in interviews uh, for my book on Arrington that uh, uh, Arrington was his model for a legislative uh, uh, leader and that he was thought in many ways he was modeling his speakership after the the, the leadership uh, portrayed by Arrington when Arrington was in the saddle. While we, as you said, you literally wrote the book on Arrington, so all of these people we could talk about for an hour, but right. let's, let's go to, we would be remiss if we didn't speak about Michael Madigan, who's been the speaker for all but two years for the last uh, 34 years or Incredible. so. Incredible. Uh, at the end of this term, as we take this, he will be the longest serving speaker, I think, in the history of the United States. Mm -hmm. What is your take on Michael Madigan? Michael Madigan is obviously an incredible individual. No, number one, he's, he's very smart. And, and I've often felt when he gets into these contests with other individuals, sometimes it's not fair because Madigan is so smart and so schooled and so researched and so up to date on everything going on that the people who might challenge him are just not up to it. In, in a crude term, Terry, 
Most of them are not as smart as Madigan, so that's a big handicap to begin with, okay? Madigan is absolutely, uh, unbelievably efficient in marshalling power and using it. And, and I think that it was said that, that you, you take uh, in, in redistricting and, and things like that, in which he's had an upper hand for years, uh, you know, he knows, uh, uh, he knows it, in, in each district what, uh, in each county, and, and this is downstate too, uh, where Democratic votes are, where Republican votes are. He is, he is so shrewd. He knows the backgrounds of every individual in the General Assembly. He knows their strengths. He knows their weaknesses. And he can play upon these, and that's what a powerful leader does. You've seen it in Congress through the years, and you see it in the Illinois General Assembly. He is um, he's extremely studious, and he, and he concentrates, and, and, and I would say he's, he's all business. And many are writing now that his main intent, his main occupation, his preoccupation is simply the maintenance of power. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. I was going to ask, what motivates him? Well, obviously, um, he wants to be, uh, wants to go down as perhaps the most powerful legislator in, in I guess, I mean, in, if in, someone in asked me, history, you know? If someone no. asked me from covering the State House, what, what is Michael Madigan's agenda? I don't know what his agenda is. Uh, he, he's not, well, I know where Governor Rounder there, talks not, about his agenda. Michael Madigan doesn't talk about it. There's not an agenda. ideological agenda where Michael Madigan is concerned. Number one, you retain power, and when you have the power he has, then you can get things done. And then he can pick and choose which issues of the day he wants to address. And if he goes into something seriously, there are many instances through the years, during his many years in power, where Madigan has forged, worked out, maneuvered a very reasonable solution to, di to a difficult problem uh, plaguing state government or plaguing the citizens of Illinois. But on the other hand, he's very, he's very, he's, he's a very stubborn individual. He is not used to being challenged. He doesn't like to be challenged. And his, his back gets up, the hair in his neck gets up pretty quick when someone takes him on or he perceives someone to be taking him on. And that can bring about the kind of situation we have now where I think it's a very personal standoff between Democrat Madigan and Republican Governor Bruce Rauner, and I think that it's is, gotten is down to a play where, where, where the interests of the state are temporarily, and the populace are temporarily shoved aside, or are put on a shelf for the time being, while we work out this, this circling, this duel between two incredibly powerful and obviously stubborn and intent on winning individuals, Madigan and Rauner. I was going to say, this, this is, would I be right in saying that this is devoid of politics? It is a personality power struggle. Oh, a personality power, power structure is certainly part of it. There's no question about that. Because Rauner is a sort of kind of individual that M M Madigan uh, and Madigan has, has, has never had an opponent of this time abiding, right? Of this caliber. Now, now Madigan has never quality. had anybody in in, in his peak years of anybody uh, attempting to stand up <coughs> to him like this. So, and and able to block, they're blocking each other. They're we have two immovable right. forces. Absolutely, a absolutely. And as a result, uh, we have Illinois held hostage. That's right. What does it say? Uh, going back to what you were saying about. Uh, Jim Thompson and Jim Edgar and George Ryan, uh, Republican governors who worked with Mike Madigan. Right. Um, I'm trying to phrase this in a, not, in a neutral way, but what does it say about th that, that things still moved through the state? We had budgets. We got things right. done. Uh, that today we find ourselves where we are, where nothing's getting done. Well, you say, why are we here? We, because Rauner was elected to try to address some serious situations in Illinois, mainly the, the, the huge uh, fiscal deficit in which we find ourselves in Illinois. And you can't blame Rauner for that. I no. mean, okay, well, I think we can agree on that. State was messed up before Rauner came into absolutely, office. Absolutely, absolutely. And, of course, uh, Speaker Madigan is uh, uh, undeniably part of the situation, uh, maybe a major part of the situation that, that has led us to our financial impasse our financial crisis in which we find ourselves in Illinois. 
Um, Rauner is, you know, has, has, has wanted to take the bull by the horns. And on this score, I think that, that uh, Rauner d should deserve some credit for trying to change things. Now, I mean, also, um, we have this situation where he's in insisting on certain uh, uh, he, he reforms uh, in terms of the business climate and so on. Mm -hmm. and, and here in Illinois, and, and the press included, uh, depicts, it, depicts uh, him as wanting radical changes uh, right to work. Uh, property tax freezes and so on. Uh, if you want to be fair here... Redistricting uh, and term limits. Yeah, right. If you look around in, 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 in other parts of the Midwest, no further than Indiana, now Missouri with right to work, uh, Robert's not asking for anything that is really radical or that has already not been put in place to a great extent in, in, in states uh, bordering Illinois. Wisconsin, Indiana. Kasich has, uh, Governor Kasich has accomplished a lot of this in Ohio. In Missouri, even where we've had uh, a Democrat in the governor's chair, uh, many of the business reforms... Now, now a more, Republican. Now, now a Republican, but, but the, Republic, the Democratic governor in Missouri, though, uh, was in accord with a lot of the business, uh, so-called business reforms that Rauner has wanted. So it, it, it's not that Rauner has this radical agenda. That, that's not the case. If you look at the fact that much of what he wants has been adopted, again, in Missouri and Iowa and Wisconsin and, and Indiana and Ohio. Um, but um, Well, as I say, thing, in a tug of war, too, you can't blame one side for pulling on the string, right? Good. I Good mean, way to put it. Good way to put it. Uh, and, and, and but I at what point do we do so much lasting damage? I mean, we have these two people that's butting deep. heads, and in the meantime, we're driving... Different people out of business. Right. We're doing it, it just all kinds of damage, you know, to nonprofits who uh, provide social services, to people running a pizzeria place in some of the college towns mm -hmm. where the students are now not going there because of the budgetary problems and woes. Uh, it might take years to build a building, but you can burn it down in a half an hour. That's right. You know? uh, is that? I mean, it's that's right. So I don't I, I don't I, I don't know what <laughs> as, as I, I, guess, I, I would talking. say for the historical record there's a lot of frustration right now about Absolutely. where Illinois is. I, I don't even know that I have a question Absolutely. to add to that. A Absolutely. Uh, right. it, it is it is something I would say relative to your right. fifty years experience right. that we have not faced before. Oh absolutely not. No, no. I have never seen anything like this before. These guys are breaking gr new ground every day with this situation as it continues year after year. And doesn't it not somewhat point out that maybe we need political reforms because we have too much power vested in too few? I agree with that. I agree. I mean, with all that. the backbenchers in the legislature yeah. are frustrated too. Yeah. Of, both of course parties. they are. Of course they are. Of course they are. And um, uh, I, I think that it, it, it's a shame that uh, a lot of individual legislators don't uh, assert themselves more. I mean, they are independently elected. And uh, they well, represent. We, we saw what happened to Kenny Duncan when he did. Yeah, that's true. That's true. That's a, a Democrat good, that's a who uh, broke with the Speaker and was that's quickly right. dispensed. That's a fair point to, to bring up. But I think that um, uh, uh, several things have happened. The, the, the so-called cutback amendment that that was pushed through by uh, then political activist <coughs> Pat Quinn back in nineteen. Can we back up? Because I wanted to bring that up. Okay. But, but okay. Let's, one of the things. This, I've never heard of this before as a student of government, and this happened before I was uh, in Illinois. But we had, as a state, three-member districts, That's which, right. which I have never heard of, as I said, in well, any other state anywhere else. But a lot of people that I've talked to who recall that right. spoke favorably of it. It was the so-called cumulative voting system, where in each house district, the majority party in the district elected two, but the minority party always had one of the three seats. And that gave the minority party a voice, and, and it, it, it meant that the leadership of the House uh, couldn't be as autonomous and all-powerful <coughs> as it is now. That cutback amendment eliminated the cumulative voting system. It, it, it reduced the number of, 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 of reps, and it, and it, 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 it introduced you know, single-member districts. And the biggest effect of it has been to make the speakership an all-powerful office. 
it actually ended up uh, enabling the, 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 the And I want, to, I want to explain why that is. Because before, when you had three member districts, right. then even in the city of Chicago, you would have Republican yes, you state did. representatives. Yes, you did. Now, sometimes, I will tell you this, they, they were, were Democrats, Democrats in disguise. disguise. Yeah. Okay, but still. They really were well, rhinos. But, right? <laughs> but your point is well taken. And, um, and, uh, and conversely, you had yeah, Democrats yeah. In, in heavy in, in Republican Dallas areas. In heavy Republican areas, you always had one Democrat. And it served to really diffuse the situation and not let any one party have complete power. And that was important, you know. And, and it, 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 you didn't have the lopsided situation that you've had now or have had for a number of years. And once again, it, 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 it provided for a, uh, 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 a leadership situation in the House where you had to take into consideration all concern. The Democrat may be in the speakership, but Republicans could not be ignored and vice versa. But by eliminating that cumulative voting system, it allowed the leadership in the House to become all-powerful. And, and I think that in looking back, that that's probably not been a totally good thing. One of the things I really wanted to talk about as well, and, and again, we, we're already going long, but let's get to the, the state of journalism. Right. We had talked when you and I first uh, broke into journalism, we would write our stories on typewriters. That's right. Uh, and uh, among the changes, and one of the, one of the primary ones, which is certainly having an impact on the the world of journalism is the uh, technology and the impact that's having on existing business models. It's obviously breaking down newspapers. It's breaking down radio stations. Right, People can put right. out their own podcast. Uh, someone like the Illinois Channel doesn't have to have a broadcast box with an right, antenna, right. so we can distribute video right. across platforms. So it's 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 both good and bad. Yeah. The bad part is to the extent that it's breaking down old business models and a lot of journalism right. entities uh, right. are, are withdrawing their reporters from the, the state, state capitol Absolutely. and covering it. And I think that's a shame. I, I think the public is, is, is ill-served by the uh, decreasing importance, relevancy of the press from in the Illinois State House. Uh, I'm a throwback to another era, as you know, Terry. Uh, I wrote my stories on a typewriter. Can you believe it that I went and filed stories at night at Western Union? <laughs> Western to send Union, the story down to Western the, Union sent my Louis. stories to St. Louis. No, that's really going back. That's like saying I'm from the Pony Express era. <laughs> I'm not quite that old, but, it's, but it, it is a valid comparison. Uh, when I came here, the press room was a very vibrant situation. You had four major Chicago dailies competing every day for stories, not just the Tribune and the Sun-Times. You had the Chicago Daily News, and you had the Chicago's American, later uh, Chicago Today. And they competed daily. You had more than one. You, you had not just the Associated Press. You had the United Press International. You had several independent news services, like the uh, Chamberlain Loftus News Service. You had freelancers who served different <coughs> papers. They were here and were making a living. Uh, you know, many of the, uh, uh, you had the two uh, St. Louis dailies had bureaus here. Not the Globe just Democrat the and Globe the Democrat and the Post-Dispatch. One right. Republican, one, one a Democratic yeah, paper. Yeah, now I will say... Uh, the, now the Post I, wouldn't I, say I, they were a Democrat. I, I, work, I work for a Democratic paper, no question about that, but I tried to be fair, believe right, me. Right, right. Okay. But, uh, you Editorially, know... Editorially, on had, the editorial yeah, page, we But you say. had, uh, you had uh, like, uh, like the Lindsey Schaub chain, and, and a lot of individual papers uh, had... Uh, had folks here on an almost daily basis. And so where, so now that we're not, what, what I mean, uh, you know, this well, right as we sit here, we had this spring, I think, five reporters leaving the Illinois State Capitol Press right. Corps. There right. used to be, you might have 30 reporters the there, and now, now in, we're getting down to like we have when, 12 or so. When the General Assembly was in session, you had 25 to 30 reporters yeah. here because Rockford would be here, Peoria would be here. Uh, not Wa anymore. Waukegan would be here yeah. and so on. And it, no, not anymore. Uh, and and uh, Shane Painter Banner, they would all be here, you know, and, and you don't have this anymore. And I think this is a shame because uh, you don't have. Uh, this this example, sounds a little bit like belly aching of reporters for their. But it's more than that because we are losing well, the tenuous thread that connects us to what's going on in public policy. Right. right? Well, what is happening is that. I really fear, 
I'm a print journalism guy, obviously. I'm an old newspaper guy, so I'm prejudiced in favor of newspapers. That, that's my life story. Right. Okay. Uh, I really fear, Terry, for the, for the f future of print journalism. I really do. Especially in terms of the big city dailies. Uh, there are more reasons I feel for this than we want to go into today. Now, I think papers in middle-sized situations uh, will, will survive. Uh, 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 like the Wayne County Press and, 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 and Pena and, and the Southern Illinois and so on. But the big boys, the big folks, are, are facing a certain future. You go through the uh, offices of, uh, of a lot of newspapers today and you see uh, empty, empty cubicles all over the place. It's not just the State House press room, it's in the home offices of the newspapers. Uh, they don't. Uh, uh, and, and, and state government coverage, since that's what we're talking about here, has suffered greatly. Uh, I, was, I was part of an incredible investigative era in state house journalism from the mid-60s up until the late 70s. And we don't have that anymore. And, and uh, uh, in, my, in my time here, uh, I was part of it. But there were a lot of good investigative reporters. Some of the best in the country came out of our state house here. And, 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 and we really... Uh, we really set a model for state house investigative reporting in the Illinois State House, and uh, I've written about it, and I mention it in all my books, and I rehash it whenever I can because it, I was very proud to be part of a golden era of state house journalism uh, here in Illinois. Well, and I was but, going but to we say, don't have that anymore. We right. I want to. I want to point out. I mean, just to point out something that's rather maybe obvious, but. The nature of the news business is there's, there's good TV stories, there's good radio stories, there's good print stories. A budget story is not a good TV story because you can't right. talk numbers right. and have people remember them, but right. you can read the numbers. Right. But TV, which typically does a package story that's a right. minute and a half to two minutes long, right. uh, is not a good medium to do investigative right. reporting. Right. 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 And people don't want to put the resources, the ownership no, doesn't want to put the resources no. To have no. someone work on a story for months no. uh, that is needed to uncover right, uh, right. whether it's corruption. Let me jump ahead just be, I mean, you can respond to that, but let me just ask something else and maybe weave this in. The other thing that happened during your era and, and, and mine was uh, the Watergate uh, story, right. which to right. me changed journalism because it did. before then, but or, or let me say, uh, after Watergate, right. and with the fame that came to investigative reporting from Woodward and Bernstein, right. Right. you had all sorts of people who wanted to be the next Woodward and Bernstein, right. Right. and their idea of journalism was that they were going to look for corruption, which is fine, but I think it also accentuated a different attitude in journalism, that there was more hostility, more of a confrontational journalism right. than a mere reporting. Am I right in that? No, you're right about that. You're right about that. No, I pointed out... And, and it was that, is that a good thing or a bad thing? or what, How should journalists... Well, I think it's neither all good nor all bad. Prof I, I think, be prof it, I think it's, it's... Professionally, how should they behave themselves? Well, I think basically you've still got to approach... Uh, coverage in a fair and balanced fashion, not to be trite in my use of words. And I think that what we're seeing uh, today is advocacy journalism. Uh, I'm not going to uh, get into the uh, national situation. We've just elected, uh, as you and I sit here, uh, Donald Trump as President of the United States. But I think that regardless of how you feel about Trump, uh, I think you're seeing an aggravated sense of what you've just talked about, of where the, the, the journalism community on a whole is very uh, aggressively negative towards Trump, and that, that's just my opinion. I'm not, I know. Uh, well, I, I would people, think any objective when, when, when observer people would watch say this, that, yeah. that they may argue, but I'm going to say that it, it's not whether I think you people agree would, with Trump some people or not, would argue but, that but they should be, I, but I, I, right, I think it's hard but, to argue that they are not. I no, think they there's are. There's no, there's very little objectivity right. in the coverage of Trump, and I think this is going to further diminish the role of the media in, 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 its, in, its, in its responsible role in our, in our American in, in democracy, way, uh, Terry. Uh, people won't think, see it as I the... I think it's a shame what we're seeing now. Uh, right. This doesn't mean you don't go into all the foibles <coughs> and, and the misstatements of Trump and all that stuff, but to deliberately try to assassinate the man with straight news stories and so on, this is going to backfire. You know, before the election, and now we're talking nationally for a second, before the election, uh, I was asked by several downstate papers to 
prophesied what was going to happen. And I'll admit to you, I, I, I predicted Hillary Clinton would win. I said it might be closer, though, than a lot of people think. But I said, regardless of who wins, a loser is going to be the media. And I really stick by that, and I think that's true. And I think that this lack of confidence in, in the media and what people are watching is only going to further downgrade the, the, the necessary responsible role of an honest media in our democracy, and I think that's a shame. What I, would you say to journalism schools in the training of journalists as far as, or just to journalists who, well, people who aspire to be journalists, what would you say to them as far as, here's how you should conduct yourself? Well, I, I went to a journalism school, Mizzou, Missouri University of Missouri, and um, I was taught the basic, I was, it was stressed there that you have to be fair and balanced. Uh, the Post-Dispatch uh, was a very liberal paper on the editorial page and so on, but the editors of the Post-Dispatch who basically molded me, whatever I've done has been because I've been molded by the editors of the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. They insisted on, on fair and balanced coverage. There was never, never, the situation was never all black or all white. There was always a middle ground, and you never wrote a story where it was all in one side and so on. There was always two sides of every story. And, and I just felt that uh, uh, we need more of that. I, I don't know, in, in, I'm, I'm not familiar, I've been away from journalism schools for a long time. I've not been to a journalism school for decades. I don't know what, what they're being taught. I do know that there's a very, here we go, there's a very liberal slant. Uh, on college campuses. There's no arguing with that. And, and I think it, it probably uh, pertains to the journalism schools as well as to other aspects of, of major university campuses. Um, I just think that we've, there's got to be more emphasis on, you, you approach a situation uh, never with an, with, with an ax to grind ahead of time or with an edge or whatever. You've got to have an open mind and I just don't see that in terms of a lot of uh, a lot of individuals. I think you take these young PAR folks that come through public the affairs reporting, public affairs reporting folks that come through the program out at UIS and so on. And I know I, I speak to them every year as do some other individuals and so on. And in talking with them, uh, it's obvious they're all Democrats. <laughs> well, this is fine. Uh, at one time, uh, I probably was a young Democrat myself, but I didn't let it show. And, well, I, just and I think your point would be you don't want to be whether it's not it's okay to be a Democrat yeah the problem yeah. the problem is if you don't but give the other side their due chance. and absolutely. listen to, and absolutely uh, and I just had an intern uh, from one of the primary journalism schools send me an article as an example on sanctuary cities well there was nothing in the article and I didn't publish it on their website right, therefore, right. There was nothing at all in that article about why one would be opposed to a right, sanctuary city. About the negative aspects yeah. of sanctuary cities. And I said, right, you know, yeah. you, you have to be. <laughs> I know. Bound. There's I, other I, sides I of the story. So and this that's is the only point this I'm is the problem that you this get. This is the problem, and you, you diagnose it very accurately. You know, you've got to present both sides. Even a situation may appear one-sided, and we're not seeing that right now. And I think that, again, I think the biggest victims of what we're seeing uh, are not going to be cable news, not going to be TV or, or, uh, or radio. It, it, it's, it's print journalism, and it's going to be the big city, the big city dailies. And I really question uh, the, the future of, and I may live to regret this, but of the future of the New York Times and uh, uh, the Baltimore Sun, and so on, and so on, yeah. and so on. Uh, well, and then and then the, we can only speculate what what happens uh, to our functioning democracy. Now, there, as the Illinois Channel is one example, there are a myriad of other media. So on one hand, right, you don't have the people that used to be the gatekeepers to information, right. As when you and I were growing up, we had three networks, right, and that was all you have. Now right. you have MSNBC, right. Fox News, Fox right. Business News. Good point. CNN. So you, you can get different... And that's all to the good. That's all to the good, right. and you can get some diversity of reporting, mm -hmm. diversity you you certainly uh, do. of opinions. So, at, plus you have the bloggers, and the bloggers were the ones that exposed uh, yeah. the flaws in Dan Rather's report on George that's W. Right. Bush that's some right. years ago. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. uh, we don't make it sound like we're just yeah, right. 
uh, belly aching about the good old days. No, That's not right. the point. Uh, right. Technology right. changes. Of course, of course. Uh, but you still have to have some fundamentals of journalism, right, as far as yeah. reporting facts. Even with all the technology. Giving, and all, giving and all people the, their due, giving both sides. And uh, all the digital miracles. Yeah, you still got to have an honest, uh, open-minded approach to, to coverage of a situation. That, that can't change, in my, in my opinion. Now, Taylor Pensano, we could speak for hours. <laughs> We've already spent a lot longer. There's a lot to cover, and it was 50 years. Uh, I hope right. we can do it again sometime. But thank I'd you. I'd love to, Terry. Thanks for your time. I, your, I, your wealth of information. And uh, we'll recommend the books that you've written for people who want to know more. Well, that'd be great. All right. Thanks again. Thank you, Terry.